Gurumila Mahagat uh, Rory. August Time Lawn Sauce said the van so live show in you. I want to say, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, that it gives me great pleasure to join you here at the Institute today. I'm very grateful for the welcome and for the opportunity to speak on Ireland and the EU after Brexit and to give a Sinn Fein perspective on the challenges that we face as an island nation now and in the time ahead. Today marks the end of an era. Britain leaves the European Union after 47 years of membership, having joined with ourselves back in 1973. No member state has ever left the Union before, so we are truly in unprecedented times. I have said many times that if the British people wish to leave the European Union, then we must respect that decision and wish them well, because that is their choice. However, it also has to be said that the very narrow, self-serving agenda of some leading Brexiteers has not only divided British public and political opinion, but has economic implications and great challenges for us all. That being said, it would be reckless to ignore the very real problems with the European Union that I believe drove so many British people to adopt a leave position. The European project is far from perfect. Too many ordinary working people feel that the EU doesn't work for them, but against them. And there is a view that the EU has strayed from the original vision of a community of nations working in partnership and solidarity for the greater good of citizens. The privatization agenda, the creep of federalism, and the eroding of state sovereignty, as well as the push for a militarized EU, are all issues that have left many European citizens feeling alienated. And this has caused a distrust of EU policymakers. That's not good for the future of the European Union because I believe the Union can be a powerful force for good in the world. And I believe it can improve the lives of workers and families in every state. But we have to change direction. We have to put citizens first. There is a growing momentum amongst progressive political movements to achieve this change of direction. And I believe that Ireland, particularly in a post-Brexit era, can be to the fore in shaping this new direction. A social European Union is possible. One where economic equality, democracy and sovereignty, accountability and a commitment to peace and demilitarization are embraced as strengths. A European Union that stands as a genuine beacon for justice and acts with purpose when human rights and democratic rights are attacked, whether that is internationally or within the EU itself, as we have seen in recent times in Catalonia. Brexit should be seen as a catalyst for positive change in the EU, a watershed, a new departure, and there is an onus on EU decision makers not to stick their heads in the sand. There is an onus to seize the moment. The European Union will only thrive on the basis of inclusivity, respect for nationhood, and crucially, on the basis of delivering real, tangible benefits for citizens. And I'm confident that we can achieve such a European Union, but we have to be up for it. We have to truly want it. I believe that Ireland's future is best served within this reformed European Union, all of Ireland, North and South, a united Ireland. Last week, the five main parties in the Northern Assembly refused to give consent to the British government to legislate on its behalf in relation to Brexit. It's no surprise that this objection is shared by our colleagues in the Scottish and Welsh administrations who also refused to give their consent to similar requests made by the British government. Brexit, as I hope we all realise, is not an orange or green issue. The majority of parties, Sinn Féin, the SDLP, Alliance and the Greens, a majority of MLAs and MPs in the North continue to oppose Brexit. Neither the people 
nor their political representatives have consented to the North leaving the European Union today. People who consider themselves to be British, Irish, both or neither, will lose practical benefits and entitlements, and there is a justifiable anger about this. The European Union has been a partner for peace in Ireland. It's provided substantial political and financial aid that has led to greater economic and social progress on an all-island basis. The negotiation and implementation of the Good Friday Agreement has been facilitated by both the Irish and British government's mem states' membership of the EU, and the peace process has benefited from that. And while the Good Friday Agreement does not expressly require Ireland and Britain to retain membership of the European Union, the agreement clearly assumes continued membership of the EU by both. The Brexit referendum campaign in 2016 did not take account of Ireland or the unintended consequences for the political, social and economic progress of the past 22 years. Consequently, the border in Ireland became a key part of Brexit negotiations. And while we now have a withdrawal agreement, a revised political declaration and an Irish protocol that mitigates the worst excesses of Brexit for Ireland, North and South. Uh, let's be clear, there is no good version of Brexit for us. I don't have to rehearse for you the last three years. Uh, I do want to say, however, that while our party's objective is the reunification of Ireland, we have developed a policy and worked hard to make the case for designated special status for the North within the European Union since 2016. And I'm all too aware, Cahirlach, that perhaps political opponents in the heat of an election campaign will ignore this. Uh, I think it's important and fair to say that we worked very constructively with the Irish government and pro-Remain parties in common cause in defence of our shared interests. It was Sinn Féin that secured cross-party consensus in the Dáil in February 2017 for the special status position. The fundamental areas we have worked hard to secure include safeguarding the peace process and protecting the Good Friday Agreement, avoiding customs checks and tariffs on this island, continued access to both the single market and the customs union, preservation of the north, south and east-west elements of the agreement which are critical to cooperation, better integration and public service provision, stopping any unionist veto at Stormont, securing the citizenship provisions core to the Good Friday Agreement, which recognise the birthright of all the people of the North to identify themselves and be accepted as Irish or British or both, as they may so choose. So we'll continue to work with all parties to maximise benefits that are in our national interest in terms of future relationships. Boris Johnson's assertion that he will not extend the transition period give us cause for concern. Negotiating a future relationship in 11 months is a tight timeline to say the least of it and represents a real risk of no deal and we must at all costs avoid this because we must prevent barriers to trade and commerce and our objective must be to avoid slowing business down or putting the cost of doing business up east, west or north to south. The provisions for avoiding a hard border through the protocol on the island of Ireland must be honoured and must take effect. There cannot, there will not be any land border on our island. Failure to comply with the withdrawal agreement could see the European Commission begin infringement proceedings against the British government at the ECJ. The protocol affirms that the Good Friday Agreement should be protected in all its parts. Sinn Féin and the other parties in the Northern Executive and Assembly will, I hope, ensure that the British government and the EU live up to these commitments and responsibilities. We now have restored power sharing government and we have a fully functioning assembly, North-South Ministerial Council and British-Irish Council. 
These institutional arrangements must continue to operate with much more vigour going forward than they have done in the past. And although Sinn Féin and the DUP are fundamentally at odds on Brexit, Michelle O'Neill and Darlene Foster as joint heads of government in the North are determined, along with the other parties, to work together in common cause to face the Brexit challenge. On the day that the new assembly sat earlier this month, Michelle O'Neill said that this is a defining moment for politics. She said, from today, the parties undertake to cooperate in every way we can in order to rebuild public trust and confidence in the assembly and executive. She said, our mission must be to deliver on health, education and jobs. And she went on to acknowledge that while people across the north, of course, want restored government to deliver public services, the political landscape of the island is changed and changing, and that cannot be ignored. Because there is now a new conversation on Irish unity underway across the island. And there is no contradiction in declaring and delivering on our firm commitment to power sharing with unionism, whilst also initiating a mature, inclusive debate about new political arrangements that examine Ireland's future beyond Brexit. Can I say there is equally no contradiction for unionism to work within the existing constitutional arrangements and at the same time taking its place in the conversation about a new Ireland? You see, a clear choice has now opened up. It's a choice between a narrow, inward-looking vision of Brexit Britain or an open, inclusive vision of a new Ireland. And it's no longer a question of if. It's a question of when a referendum on Irish unity will be held. In April 2017, you will recall that the EU made an important declaration. They said that in the event of Irish reunification, the North would automatically rejoin the EU as part of a united Ireland. So for very many people from all traditions and backgrounds, Irish unity is now seen as the best way, the only way, in fact, to stay within the European Union. Many with a British or unionist identity are now actively considering the merits of reunification, not to become Republicans, clearly, but to remain European. This is backed up by the unprecedented number of people applying for Irish passports. People are acting in their own interests and are coming to the conclusion that those interests are best served in a new Ireland that is part of the EU. Sinn Féin is fully invested and committed to the Good Friday Agreement's political framework. The commitment to a referendum on unity is within this agreement and it can't be cherry-picked. And I'm not proposing, to be clear, despite what some may suggest, that we hold this referendum tomorrow or next month. I've set out very clearly and consistently that I believe a five-year time frame is realistic and sensible. And I've also said that we need to start the planning now. Because the simple reality is that Brexit has exposed the failure and the undemocratic nature of partition. It's a political problem that requires a political solution. Over the last number of elections in the North, the notion of a perpetual unionist majority, the very basis of partition, has disappeared. Demographic shifts are evident, and a public conversation is now underway on the constitutional future of our island. The Irish unity question, of course, has taken on a whole new dynamic because of Brexit. Political momentum is now moving in that direction. And I want us to to arrive and to sustain on an agreed Ireland. And I'm very conscious that Sinn Féin does not and should not own this debate. And I think that everybody is being challenged to rethink our economic and political futures. Citizens look to see what their best interests, where their best interests are served. And the people of this island must have that choice between Brexit or reunification. So, if in government, I will seek to begin preparatory work in parallel with civil society, uh, which has now sustained this conversation for quite some time. 
We need also to consider how we help our neighbours from a British and unionist identity, how we assist them into this conversation without surrendering their identity or their allegiance. Because the new Ireland that we seek isn't for nationalists or Republicans alone. It has to be for everyone who shares this island and everyone must feel that they belong. In considering the future, we must also remember that the North in reuniting would be uh, doing so with the pre-existing state within the EU. We must remember that Article 3 of Bunrocks Naharan anticipates reunification and also that an international agreement guarantees continuity of protections. Those protections, of course, are laid out in the Good Friday Agreement, so we are not starting from a blank slate. It's clear that building a new Ireland will require the participation and cooperation of all our people. And it's particularly clear and evident that the Irish government must commit themselves to, do this, to this objective. I will do that. The British government also has a duty to join in developing the necessary process that will recognise this reality and give effect to the requirements as agreed in the Good Friday Agreement and to make the required investment of political will and resources. So I believe any incoming government must enter into discussions with the British government in order to create the framework and atmosphere necessary for this conversation. It will be necessary for negotiation and discussion to take place prior to any referendum because we must at all costs avoid a repeat of the mistakes that we witnessed in Britain. In government, Sinn Féin would press for such engagement. The British-Irish Intergovernmental Conference is, I believe, a mechanism to facilitate this discussion. The conference, as you are aware, was set up under the Good Friday Agreement to promote bilateral cooperation between both governments. So costing reunification and carrying out an examination of new political arrangements, which fully respect the obligations and commitments of the Good Friday Agreement, is crucial. This must include implementing outstanding commitments. So I believe, as a matter of urgency, we need to establish a national forum to carry out this necessary consideration, engagement and consultation. In government, Sinn Féin would establish a constitution unit within government with responsibility for North-South relations, political dialogue and negotiation, planning and preparation for the referendum on unity. And when that unity referendum is secured and won, there would then be a necessary period of preparation and transition for the island of Ireland to become a reunified state. This period between a referendum and reunification would see further negotiation, obviously between Dublin and London, but also importantly with the European Union. The governments as agreed in the Good Friday Agreement, commit to work together constructively in light of the outcome of such a referendum in the best interests of all the people. Following a vote for reunification, agreements would be needed between the Irish and Westminster governments setting the parameters for Ireland's transition. These would set out the precise reunification timetable. And there are ways in which the EU can ensure that the transition to Irish unity and maintaining membership of the EU are supported. Indeed, that can start now by affording observer status in the European Parliament to Northern MEPs. The future will also, in my view, require an All-Ireland Party to play an active role in these discussions. Having Sinn Féin ministers in government north and south is the best way to protect Ireland's interest in the next phase of Brexit negotiations and as we move towards a unity referendum. The Good Friday Agreement gives people the opportunity and choice to decide our future together. Brexit is a threat to Ireland's future political stability and economic prosperity. And these challenges require new thinking, and a radical and innovative response to forge a new relationship. During the course of this decade, we mark the centenaries of key seminal events that have shaped modern Irish history over the past century and have defined our relationship with Britain. 
a relationship characterised by colonialism, rebellion, partition and political division, and over the past 22 years marked by peace, reconciliation, renewed cooperation and mutual respect. As we approach the centenary of partition, let's not refight old battles. The future will be forged by political leadership. It will certainly require creativity, imagination and innovation, and we must succeed. The best hope for future success is to bring the people of our island together. This is a defining period in our history and the history of Europe. It is a time for big ideas, for inclusive conversations and for ambitious plans and for generosity. I believe we've entered a decade of opportunity where the freedom to choose our own future will be decided by the people of this island. It's time to bring our people together in harmony and friendship because we can transform this country. It's a time to unite all of the people who share this island and to seize what is the opportunity of a lifetime. Gurmila Mahagov. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I'm now going to put the uh, proposal or put the matter of your discussions uh, to the floor, and I'm looking for speakers who want people who want to speak. I don't person here. The microphone coming up. Thank you, Una O'Dwyer, member of the Institute. Thank you indeed for a, a very clear expose of a, a vision for Ireland and Ireland in a reformed Europe. Uh, my question is, I, and indeed, in, given this vision and given uh, your, um, also your ambition for, to participate in government in this part of Ireland, I'm wondering how you would forge uh, the necessary alliances in Europe to bring to fruition this vision. After all, the decision-making procedures of Europe are de dependent on good alliances between member states, between political groups, and between individuals. So Sinn Féin in government would have ministers going regularly to councils and would need the British who are there no more to be our allies in various issues, they weren't in every aspect our allies, but we will certainly need allies in the future on a wide range of issues, including Eurovision for Europe. Thank you. Can I answer? So thank you very much, Una, for, for that question. And you're right, of course, progress in, in any field of life, but, but most particularly in politics and diplomacy, and very particularly when you seek to achieve a transformational agenda such as I have set out requires allies, uh, some of which might be temporary or circumstantial, others which will be more uh, enduring. Uh, if, if Sinn Féin has uh, vast experience in one thing, it is huge experience in negotiations. Actually, for so long as I have been uh, a member and certainly a public representative for this party, I, I can't recall a time where we haven't been uh, in negotiation, not just with the British government, but very often with others too, such as the nature of the peace process, uh, Una. Um, I believe in, in the course of the Brexit uh, negotiation, the, the, the initial phases where the Irish question was front and centre, I believe that we had very productive exchanges, not just with Michel Barnier, uh, Ver, Mr Verhofstadt and, and their, their teams, uh, but also we had, um, I think, very impactful exchanges and relationships in the United States that I think were, were, were critical, actually, uh, at different points in the unfolding Brexit narrative. So the answer to your question, Una, is that yes, any member of government, any minister, of course, has to build those relationships and those alliances. And... Uh, Perhaps, uh, I hope I would reassure you in telling you that we are more than capable uh, of achieving precisely that. Whoever is in government, that's the job. The, the last doll, Cahirlach, um, in the course of it, and it was a difficult doll because the numbers were fractured 
and we had what was dressed up as new politics, but it wasn't really new politics. It was old politics occupying government and opposition benches all at the same time, in my analysis. But in any event, um, for the very most part, we managed to achieve a consensus in the national interest on the issue of Brexit. I think that was a necessary thing. By the way, I think that would be necessary into the future. I think it would be absolutely essential that Brexit doesn't become a platform for opportunistic point scoring. And I think you can look to the record of my party and see very, very clearly that we were um, very constructive and productive in our, in our contribution over the last number of years. Thank you very much. There's a question there. Please, if you could just stand up and give your name yes, and institution, if any, that you're a member of. Thank you, Deputy MacDonald, and thanks again to the IIA for hosting this uh, very important series of discussions. My name is Selena Donnelly. I work with Trokra. Uh, Trokra have been involved in climate justice um, campaigning on, um, on and with the communities that we work with overseas um, because they're facing the most immediate consequences of the climate and biodiversity crisis. So it's a question that we, along with Stop Climate Chaos uh, Network, have been putting to all party leaders um, that are seeking to form the next um, government, which is, um, would, uh, if in government, <laughs> you push for uh, um, Ireland to be a member of the uh, EU member states, there's a group in that are calling for an increase in the EU's 2030 uh, climate targets to at least 55%. Um, we, when we really need to actually be aiming for 65% emissions reductions in line with the latest findings of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And correlated to that, at home here to work to deliver an 8% a year annual reduction in emissions in the lifetime of the next government, which is appreciably very ambitious, but is what we require um, to, to see, seize the opportunity to deal with this crisis. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Selena, for, for that question. Uh, we will work to and for the most uh, ambitious targets possible. And I, I think it's very good that Trokra sets the bar at so what some might consider an ambitious or a high level, but a realistic level in terms of the sustainability of the planet. I'm very conscious since we're talking about international and, and European affairs that, of course, the, the, the climate change agenda is intimately bound up with social justice, the international social justice agenda. Um, the way that we trade um, and uh, the fact that the poor South, despite very often a lot of, of very worthy lip service, uh, has been left behind. Uh, in, in, the, in my remarks, when I, when I set out our ambitions for Ireland, for, for a new model and for a new Ireland here and for a new Europe, um, I am very conscious of the fact that that social justice agenda has to be hardwired into the politics uh, of the European Union because I actually think it's what aligns very, very closely with the values and the aspirations of citizens right across, right across the, the Union. Um, so the answer to your question is yes, we, we have differences of opinion on discrete policy matters, so you'll know that we don't favour a carbon tax. I can hear an, an intake of breath in the room. Uh, but you might also know that, in fact, carbon taxes are a matter of controversy amongst Greens and environmentalists uh, internationally. The objective has to be to reduce emissions, not to take uh, actions that are box-ticking exercises or that are designed uh, to make an administration look good. And just to say to you, Selena, in the, in the course of this campaign, obviously we're out across the country and talking to hundreds if not thousands of people at this stage, um, I'm, I'm happy to tell you that the issue of climate change, the environment, climate action is very much on people's agenda and it comes down to even talking to people who live in very poor housing stock and who are cold in their homes and who are now making a very direct connection between their own living conditions and circumstances and a much, much bigger agenda. And the final word is this. Those movements that I referred to, progressive movement, movements that I believe can actually break through some of the, the, st the stagnation of the, the European Union decision-making bureaucracy, I would say to you the chief amongst that is actually the, the movement for, for climate justice. 
I think um, the matter is so pressing. It is so uh, generationally charged now, particularly for younger citizens. I think it has real capacity not just to deliver on, on the targets that you've, that you've outlined there, but to, to do so much more. Thank you very much. Stand up. Francis. Thanks very much. Francis Jacobs, member of the Institute. Uh, thanks very much, Mary Lou, for your talk. Um, you mentioned very uh, powerfully that Ireland, uh, your, the Ireland's place within a reformed European Union. I'd like to know what are the main elements of what, the things you would like to see reformed within the European Union? How do you want to get Irish citizens on board? How would you consult and involve them? And one final, and I know very sensitive question, what's your position on the future European budget? Because one way of having greater solidarity within the European Union is to go away from this obsession with the 1% and to complement you know, common sure. agricultural policy spending by having new, streng stronger spending on cohesion and so on, and to increase the budget beyond 1%. Thank you okay. very much. So um, let me start with the budgetary question first. Um, you'll not be surprised to hear that I believe that we contr should contribute more for the budget when it represents social transfers and supports uh, for community endeavour and anti-poverty measures and innovation and education and uh, all of the things that the budget does. But equally, Francis, you won't be surprised to hear me say that uh, I do not believe that the European budget, uh, an expansionary budget, should be used to enrich the armaments industry and to prop up an increasingly militarised union. I think that is wrong. I think that is wrong. And I think those within the European decision-making uh, apparatus, uh, I'm sure, are well aware that for the vast majority of citizens of the European Union, that is not the way in which they wish their tax euros to be spent. And yet, it continues. In terms of the, 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 new, the, the shape of a new Europe, Europe, maybe it's more helpful for me to give you an example from, from an Irish perspective around something that I, I think needs to change. I think it's absolutely doable and shouldn't be a matter of controversy. The European treaties uh, are replete uh, with um, reference to common foreign and security policy and NATO and, and that axis. The European neutrals don't have a place, a, an explicit recognition within the constitutional framework, within our basic law. I think that's wrong. Uh, I think we have to recognise for um, countries that are m uh, neutral by tradition and by value, uh, that we have our place too. The European Union should not be a holding room, an anti-room mm. uh, for closer and deeper cooperation with NATO, for creating military alliances, and for ultimately membership of NATO. Uh, and, and you will know, even though I, I have to say this issue of neutrality is not an issue on the, on the doorsteps, uh, you know that when the, the matter of the European project gets unpacked and discussed in this country, perhaps to the surprise of the political establishment, hey presto, the issue arises again, because it's a matter of deep value, social and political value um, here. I wouldn't propose, Francis, that I have uh, all of the answers, although I have a lot of the questions uh, on, on this matter. I think um, in the conversation uh, and the necessary preparations for the referendum on unity and constitutional change on our island, I think um, of necessity surfaces a number of the other issues in terms of Ireland and our relationship with the European Union and our shared vision of how that might look. So we could very usefully, um, we could very usefully address both issues in, in parallel. I think the use of citizens' assemblies in recent times on issues that were, let's face it, utterly taboo, no-go areas for, for political life, issues like marriage equality, issues like women's reproductive rights. Citizens' Assembly and that kind of deliberative method have proved very, very valuable. Um, and I think those are the kind of tools that we would need um, to use. Thank you very much. I see a question there, yes. Please, this man. Yeah. 
Hello, thank you. Uh, Stefan Corsa, French ambassador. Um, I have a, a sort of follow-up question on the common uh, foreign and security policy mm -hmm. of the EU. Would you, um, if you were in government, would you uh, agree to the perpetuation of, uh, of uh, Irish uh, training personnel in places like EUTM Mali? What would be your overall position on the, on the participation of such, uh, uh, to such missions? Our, our overall position is that uh, operations must have a UN mandate. We want to operate within an international multilateral system. Um, and I know that we are very, very proud of our defence forces and the role that we play. I, I would argue, and I think lots, I don't think I'm on my own, uh, in saying that our personnel are particularly effective because of our tradition and position of neutrality. I don't see it as a deficit, I see it as a huge uh, strength. Uh, but we certainly do not favour moves and measures that incrementally bring us closer towards uh, what would be, um, what would be uh, relationships with NATO and, and, and so on. So th that's our position, uh, and I would be true to that position. And I think that position, as I said early, earlier, is very much in line with Irish public sentiment and values on this subject. People uh, want a form of active neutrality. It's not a case of sitting on the sidelines and watching the world go by. Um, but what we bring to the table as a small island nation uh, is not military might or hard power. We should not try to ape or mim mimic that. We bring something uh, quite unique in, in many respects, and, and that is our, our standing uh, and our neutrality, and I think we need to cherish that, foster it, uh, and not damage it. Thank you very much. There's a question here. Hi. And then there's another Hi. question there, and then yourself. Thanks, Mary Lou. Um, Brona Higgins with Concern Worldwide. Um, just, you mentioned Sinn Féin's experience in kind of moving from colonial type relationship to more peace building. Um, and going through your manifesto, particularly on the foreign affairs and trade, um, it's outlined that in an international relations policy, among other areas, prioritised would be international law and human rights. And I'm wondering, in a Sinn Féin-led government, what kind of approach would you take to the kind of increasing irreverence for international law that we're witnessing um, on a global scale? And I'm thinking most recently the recent peace deal, Middle East peace deal announcement, um, which effectively whitewashes um, permanent occupation and move toward annexation. And so what would be the response of a Sinn Féin government toward that moving beyond token condemnations? Um, so that would be the first part. And then speaking to that, what kind of role could Ireland have in, in the Security Council bid? Um, what could we bring to the table there in, in the kind of environment that's prevailing at the moment? Um, and secondly, with re regards to development overseas aid, um, in the manifesto it mentions a whole of government approach mm -hmm. um, and ensuring accountability for overseas aid. What does that mean? What would that look like? Uh, what's missing at the moment and, and what would you like to see changed? Okay, thank you. So um, I heard the US president uh, make his, what did he call it, a deal of a lifetime or some, some such description. And I heard him ponder that um, the occupation of Palestinian lands, you know, th that it might be, that it's speculated that this is in breach of, of international law. Of course, there's no speculation necessary. It's absolutely illegal. And the truth is that the Palestinian people have been very much left on their own. Um, I think the European Union has been very, very weak uh, in terms of flexing the collective muscle that will be necessary uh, to ensure that Palestinian, the basic rights to self-determination to your land, to your place, to your home, uh, is uh, finally recognized in a two-state solution. And I know that's a, a matter of controversy, but that's my, that's my assessment um, of it. Uh, I know that a lot of European parliamentarians are very active and very moved on this issue, just as it is the case in the Dáil. But that has, not, that has not ricocheted up. It hasn't ratcheted up to the highest levels. I, I fail to see how you bring peace and equ equilibrium to the Middle East 
whilst um, Palestine, Palestinian refugee camps are the norm. And when people have their homes bulldozed ruthlessly and are left homeless and utterly traumatised and degraded. So we need to get to grips with this. What, what does the government have to do? Well, we've actually passed, I think on two occasions, a motion in the Dáil uh, looking for recognition for the Palestinian state. Now, I know that doesn't solve the bigger problem, but I think it's, it's time now for people to step up. The, the outgoing government, uh, Simon Coveney, as, as minister, would argue, yes, we need to do something, but not now. Well, my question is, if it's not now, well, then when is it? So we have to, the first thing we have to do is we have to take a stand. The second thing we have to do is to work with European uh, allies. But this situation cannot continue, and no government and no head of government can act with impunity. That's a very, very dangerous thing to happen. We learn through history what happens when very powerful people believe that the rules don't apply to them, that they can cherry pick them. So I, I think we have to take a stand for Palestine and then it has a, a, a broader um, application. In terms of the Security Council, I think we need to be honest with ourselves uh, if we are seeking uh, a place at the table that we're very clear what we wish to do with it. I, 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 I have a sense that there would be an expectation of Ireland that we would be a vehicle uh, for other places that have suffered colonization, um, other places that find themselves in poverty and need uh, as a result of that. And I'm not sure that we've always used those. I know we have, there are standout examples of, of Ireland, you know, advancing uh, very strongly on, on the international stage, but I'm not sure that we have always used those opportunities uh, to best effect. So uh, when we talk about a, a whole of government um, approach in terms of human rights and international affairs, it's actually very much tied up with the question on, on climate justice because these things in many ways are inseparable. And it's about understanding that we do live in a global village and it's about hardwiring these matters into a domestic agenda that isn't just a matter that arises on hustings for elections, for example. And I think we can do that. I, I actually think the climate agenda now means that we can't not do it anymore. And I think that's a positive thing because it keeps, it will keep a bit of discipline and a bit of heat on whomsoever it might be uh, who sits around the next cabinet table. Thank you very much indeed. Question over here, please, followed by yourself next. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed uh, for, for the address. Mari Cross, member of the Institute. I just noted you mentioned um, that uh, your policy would be to act with purpose when human rights are attacked. Mm -hmm. I just wonder how you mean that should be implemented. I mean, would you feel that the EU should adopt a more muscular approach in foreign policy? Should we be intervening militarily in conflicts where human rights are egregiously um, abused? Uh, uh, are uh, peacekeeping missions, yes, but uh, something more muscular, firmer in terms of foreign policy? And uh, also security, I think various polls have shown that Irish people, among other uh, nationalities, that security is a very high uh, on their, uh, on their um, uh, radar in, in terms of uh, expectations of the EU, that the EU will protect them. And protection means taking action, for example, in the countries surrounding the EU, and if necessary, intervening. So uh, my question really is, would, we s would your policy be to stay in the anti-room and say not provide solidarity with uh, other member states if they were taking action in this regard, as I say, to, to uh, uh, protect human rights in the broader sense? Okay. So I, 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 my perspective on this is that we've had uh, lots of muscular foreign policy. Uh, and it hasn't, it hasn't ended up well. Um, I mean, I absolutely accept that the international community has to act in concert to protect basic, to protect life, to protect the rule of law, to protect people's democratic and human rights. Um, 
but I, I think if you take a step back and take a, a, a perspective on where the world is right now, um, as I see it, that very muscular approach, as you describe it, has proved to be utterly counterproductive in recent times and didn't bring the kind of safety and stability uh, that, we, that we require. Our first stop uh, in any of these conflicts has to be the art of diplomacy and engagement. And I think speaking as um, somebody from a first world country and a, a European tradition, I think we have to have a bit of humility uh, in terms of how we address conflicts um, and even regimes that don't meet with our approval, that are oppressive regimes in other parts uh, of the world. We, we need to meet people where they are at and we need to, in the first instance, attempt to resolve disputes uh, by talking and by diplomatic means. I am not, uh, you will uh, understand, I'm not suggesting that Ireland sits on the sidelines. I don't think we've ever done that. I don't think that would be a fair assessment uh, of us. But I would not see us joining forces with others, even within the European Union, that have a very, very different history to ours, a very, very different tradition to ours, that are aligned uh, states. Um, because we have something different to bring to the table. And I think that we shouldn't get mesmerized or distracted by all of the apparatus of this more muscular type foreign policy when in, in fact it is diplomatic endeavor and intervention and often softer interventions that actually yield the bigger result. Um, and I think we, I mentioned, I spoke about Palestine earlier if ever there was uh, an example of muscular responses um, and disproportionate responses uh, in a region of the world, well, there's your, there's your evidence of it. I, I, I don't think that is the successful, uh, a recipe for success. Thank you. Lady Nell, your question, um, please. Irene Duffy Lynch, a member of the Institute, and this is on a completely different subject, but I'm coming at it from the European point of view. We have a huge obesity problem in this country, growing problem, clogging up our hospitals, making people more poor than they already are. Uh, is this something that Sinn Féin uh, takes into account and is it looking at a European countries, Great Britain apart, I think, they do not seem to have this problem. From my time living in Europe in European countries and from my many, many visits currently to Europe, they don't seem to have this problem. So, um, would Sinn Féin, uh, if they were in government, or even as we speak, are you considering this growing problem, maybe, and looking at what the Europeans are doing from... Um, Can you hold the microphone up here? Uh, looking at what the Europeans are doing to um, control this growing um, catastrophe, actually. Okay. I think the biggest, the single biggest societal uh, problem that has health effects is probably poverty. Um, in fact, it's definitely poverty. Uh, if you look across sections of our population, I'm thinking of traveler citizens uh, and look at their uh, life expectancy, look at their life experiences, look at their health, the health uh, indices, uh, they suffer disproportionately. Uh, and that's not because of some genetic pre disposition to obesity or anything else, it's because they're poor. Um, so certainly in terms of public health, uh, our approach has to be in the first instance to keep people well. You know, health and the health agenda should not always be reactive and I think you make uh, a strong case in that regard. I think people's diet, uh, what they consume, what they cook, if they cook, um, again can, can largely be traced to what their disposable income is. Not in every case, but in, in, in many, many cases. So yes, that is uh, an issue that needs to be addressed as a matter of public health. Um, so too does uh, excessive alcohol consumption or the consumption of tobacco, all of these, these big issues. But a, a common denominator in terms of keeping people well, and of course with an eye to the public purse uh, as well and, and the efficiency of the health system, will be to have a very, very proactive uh, anti-poverty strategy that's multifaceted, 
that's not just about income levels, although that is important, but that is also about uh, opportunity in every respect, educationally, culturally, through the arts, all of that. And I think there's a, a real need uh, in, a, in a society where the talk is about economic recovery, that we actually grind back down to basics uh, and we look at our communities, many of whom um, are hugely under-resourced in every respect. And we get under the bonnet of that and, and we figure it out. The best people to come up with solutions to any issue within their community is generally people in the community themselves. Um, Could I just come back on that, please? I think myself the answer is education. Uh, for example, and it's, it, the obesity is not just uh, among the poor. Can you use the microphone so others yeah. can hear you, please? Uh, I think the answer is education, really. Uh, when I was in secondary school myself, I had two and a half hours of practical cooking every, every week. I had two hours of uh, theory. I know what food is about. My husband, who was in a boys' secondary school, they never had anything like that. After 40 years living with me, he still doesn't get it. He's not overweight, but uh, he eats the wrong things. So I think it's education, and I think it has to become... Um, 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 an exam subject, uh, a serious subject, uh, because it's not just the poor. Um, and um, so perhaps you might think about okay. that if you're in government. <coughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to put a question to you, if I may now. Sure. Uh, after 47 years, as you said in your opening remarks, um, mm -hmm. Britain is leaving and Ireland is staying, whereas before we were very much joined together on matters European, and in fact Ireland is a much smaller entity than Britain, uh, on many occasions was able to use a common position uh, to protect our own interests. Uh, that's no longer the case, and we need, in my view, I will put it to you, uh, to reconstruct a new relationship with the United Kingdom. Uh, but we need to take that initiative because I think the battering and the bruising that the British people have gone through over Brexit is not going to want them to uh, take that initiative themselves. If you are part of the next government, uh, what action do you think that government should take to fill that vacuum that has now arisen in terms of the daily interaction that Irish diplomats and Irish European member uh, individuals of one kind or another had with their English or British counterparts? Well, I, I think in the first instance, uh, Rory, we need to work the institutions that we already have. I mean, one of the mistakes that was made uh, in recent years, and this was prior to the collapse of the institutions in the North, is that the Intergovernmental Conference didn't meet nearly regularly enough. It just wasn't innovative or proactive enough. So I think the first thing we need to do is to uh, use the, the north-south mechanisms, the east-west mechanisms that we have, and make them dynamic. I think beyond that, we need to look at a, almost a network of relationships between the two islands. So there is a necessary relationship between the government in the north, in Belfast, uh, and with our, our Welsh and Scottish friends. And that, of course, those, of course, are evolving stories too, not least because of Brexit. And then, of course, the, the critical relationship with London needs to be built on. I don't have a set view uh, in, in huge detail as to what that exactly will look like, um, except to say that we need to measure, all, of course, depending on what the outcome what the final uh, relationship looks like between Britain and the European Union, because that will shape things greatly. Uh, so uh, in that context, uh, we need to look at those relationships and we, we need to employ every and any mechanism to ensure that we maintain robust relationships. That's for lots of reasons, for trading reasons, for economic reasons, for social and cultural reasons. But above all, because a section of our people in the northeast of this island are British. And that relationship now, that relationship in a new Ireland, a reunified Ireland, will always be an important one. So it, it, has, a, it has a particular importance for, for all of us. I, I think just to say to you that everybody accepts 
at least privately, if not publicly, uh, that the ball was dropped in, in respect of the, the British-Irish intergovernmental conference and those relationships. That can't happen again. So first order of business is to correct that. Um, second order of business is to the very best of our ability um, to build an informed dialogue with our friends across the water as they embark now on this next leg of their negotiations with the European Union. Obviously, they're bilateral negotiations and we can't intervene. Uh, we're represented, obviously, uh, as, as an EU state. But I do think that we have a role uh, by way of informing and also challenging uh, the British government on stances that they would take. So because we are an all-Ireland party, uh, we would have reason to have very close contact with the Secretary of State of the day, with, the, with, the, with ministers and with the Prime Minister of the day. And I can assure you that they are consistently challenged in terms of decisions that they might make or positions that they adopt that are damaging to this island. And that certainly will continue. Thank you very much. I don't understand this question there. Last question for today. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. I'm the Italian ambassador. Sorry, I was late. But uh, I, I can't remember when I arrived here two years ago that a piece of information that struck me in particular was the one that Ireland is the only European country to have a level of population lower than 200 years ago. And to this problem is, is bounded the other one of, uh, of housing, which is part of your program of, of government. And another piece of information is that in this respect, Italy, we have a lot of problems, as everybody knows. But at least we have not this problem in the sense that uh, uh, the, the, the level, the 80%, more than 80% of the population owns his own apartment, of the, 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 the place where he lives. Uh, so I think this is an important, certainly a fundamental problem for the future of uh, of, of, uh, of Ireland, and you know it very well, I suppose. Thank you. Yes, uh, Ambassador, thank you for that uh, observation. Um, yes, uh, it is safe to say that we are at a point of crisis in terms of housing and accommodation. Um, the statistics are there for one and all to see, um, but the real devastation is in the stories behind those numbers, which are devastating in their in in how dismal uh, they are. Uh, we have no excuse and we have no alibi as a wealthy country uh, to have the level of child homelessness that we currently have. Like there's no rational explanation. There's no excuse for that, uh, except that the the state and the government has failed. And the state and the government now needs to start succeeding and achieving on this agenda in particular. Um, I don't have to rehearse for you, I'm sure, Ambassador, the whole history of the, the, the bubble that burst and the economic catastrophe that followed. Um, but I think it is uh, fair to say that there has been a view, an ideological view, uh, shared by successive governments that housing was a matter for the private sector and that the state sat back and allowed provision to, to, to come from the, from the private sector. That's failed. So in a nutshell, the state and the government needs to get active and become interventionist. Uh, we're proposing a number of things in, in, the, in the manifesto, if you've read it, in terms of public housing provision. Um, also in terms of retrofitting and um, environmental uh, sustainability initiatives uh, but we're also uh, proposing a rent freeze because mm -hmm. rents in this country are crazy and it can't continue the, the freeze that we envisage would be for a three-year period and that our understanding is that that uh, addresses the constitutionality concern that some have have raised but we have to do something and the housing and the demographic piece, because that's been discussed, not least because of pensions. We were talking about this earlier. Um, you know, if, if we are not giving our young people a chance to settle here, 
to work here, to contribute here, to start their families here, well, they will simply go elsewhere and we are going to have a demographic crisis. Uh, I think when you meet countless uh, younger people and they tell you, look, I'm, I'm never really going to own my own home or I can't afford the rent and I'm back living with my parents in their 20s and 30s, uh, we, we need to fix that. It can be fixed, but it's going to take a lot of political will. It's not an easy task, but I believe it, it can be done. I also happen to believe that we have the right person in our team uh, who would make an ideal minister for housing. I, I'll name him Owen O'Brien. Um, so uh, it, that would be certainly, if you were to ask me what would be the, the, the absolute core concern for us, the core social dilemma that needs to be resolved, it is the issue of housing. And I think the next government cannot fail. We can't have more of the same because it has been, frankly, disastrous. Can I, on your behalf, thank you very much thank for you. your uh, contribution. You've been very generous with your time, but you've also been very open and frank uh, in the propositions of your party and your analysis of various matters that we have discussed. Uh, you are very welcome here. As many people may not know, you once were here in a different capacity, mm -hmm. uh, so you've come back full of glory in the meantime. <laughs> uh, can I ask you to show your appreciation in all the way?